thank you for the kind introduction. I'm Adam Balog, infrastructure expert at the Secretariat. And yes, as it has been introduced by Barbara, I will have an introductory guide to technologies and applications of power to gas P2G. And I will also touch up on um, other hydrogen production technologies. So this will, this, again, it's an introductory guide. We'll focus on hydrogen technologies. Um, and Barbara just wrote me that my camera is off, which is strange, because I did not turn it off. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think we, we might be able to go ahead without the camera then. What do you think, Barbara? Yes, and I'll just go ahead. Yes, indeed. I, I think we proceed without. Yes. So, um, yes. Um, as I mentioned, power to gas technologies, production of hydrogen, um, and various uses of the hydrogen, and additionally also um, the synergies between the different utilizations. So on the screen you can see now the presentation overview, um, and then the goal of the presentation is that um, the topic of power to gas and hydrogen in general is, is very much um, um, on high levels already ongoing within the EU, also uh, between industry players, uh, regulators are involved, and transmission system operators are involved, renewable generators are involved within the European Union and member states, pilot projects are ongoing, regulatory sandboxes are being created to learn about the successful and economically, financially feasible application of hydrogen technologies. And uh, however, so far in the energy community contracting parties, uh, this discussion has not been very vivid. And uh, also with this presentation and with this introductory guide, uh, our partial goal is to, is to bring this discussion to the contracting parties as well. The video will be also available on YouTube, so anyone who is not here, or if you would like to share it with, with others, you will be able to do so. Uh, also, um, we are in the process of commissioning a hydrogen potential study for the contracting parties, which we will launch um, soon, and uh, hopefully we will be finished uh, with it by the end of, uh, by the beginning of 2021, hopefully January, uh, which will assess the potential of applying hydrogen technologies in the contracting parties of the energy community. Yes, so, so touching up on the first chapter, overview of the hydrogen production technologies. Now, now I have to warn everyone that I'm not a chemist. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I have tried to um, have an, a basic overview about the existing and uh, partially experimental hydrogen production technologies which exist now. And I will start with the currently existing mostly large scale and hydrocarbon based hydrogen production technologies. Um, first one, which is the most widespread and uh, very significant part of hydrogen production in the world today, is carried out with the steam methane reforming technology, SMR which produces uh, synthesis gas, thin gas, which is carbon monoxide and hydrogen from uh, methane, or it can use this process also other hydrocarbons, plus uh, water, practically steam, that, that's why the heat is in there. And uh, it is followed usually by the so-called water shift gas reaction, which will produce uh, further hydrogen from the carbon monoxide. Uh, this is mostly carried out in large industrial uh, settings, in refineries, by uh, refinery and in integrated oil companies. It is very CO2 intensive, uh, approximately to produce one ton of hydrogen, uh, nine tons of CO2 is emitted. Another widespread technology is the so-called autothermal reforming, ATR, um, and you can see the equation there. And this is also used in large scale. And the third one, which is actually a very old technology uh, also, is the coal gasification. 
um, which on top of that um, you can use again the water shift gas reaction to produce additional hydrogen from the carbon monoxide which is produced. Uh, the coal gasification is four times more carbon, carbon dioxide intensive than the ATR. And in order to make these technologies less greenhouse gas intensive, uh, carbon capture could be introduced, would be needed, and that would um, make them potentially compliant with, with, with the climate plan. At the same time, uh, carbon capture and storage is uh, very capital intensive. Nevertheless, there are existing pilot projects, semi-commercial projects existing also in Europe. Um, but in order to reduce the GHG intensity of these technologies, this is a crucial step. Additionally, to make it possibly more green, electrolysis can be used to produce uh, the O2 molecules in those procedures where, where the O2 molecule is needed, where the oxygen is needed. So this is basically, these technologies are the industry standard as of today. Now let's move into um, the uh, pyrolysis technologies, uh, sorry, electrolysis technologies, um, which uh, there are three technologies which are widely discussed nowadays. Uh, First one, alkaline electrolysis, AEL, which is uh, using a saline solution to separate hydrogen from water molecules by applying electricity. Of course, for all of them, uh, it's electrolysis, so it needs electricity input. The second one, proton exchange membrane, PEM, which is considered to be slightly less mature, uh, and it is a solid membrane technology to separate hydrogen. And the third technology is Solid oxid electrolysis, SOEC, which is a high temperature elect electrolysis of steam. I have put up some examples um, with regards to existing European electro electrolyzers, which are available now on the market. And uh, historically, Europe is an industry leader in, in, in electrolyzer production on the world market. And it's due to earlier uh, applications like chlorine uh, electrolysis, where uh, European industry companies have developed a relative competitive advantage over other producers. So there, Europe would start from a good basis and could uh, potentially use its own hydrogen technology in the European Union and potentially energy community to scale up its, uh, its applications and, uh, and be a leader on the world market. Of course, here the greenhouse gas intensity, the carbon intensity of the procedure uh, depends on the electricity mix, which is used to, uh, to produce the hydrogen with the electrolysis. So if you produce hydrogen with electrolysis from renewables, practically solar or wind, then your hydrogen production will be so-called green hydrogen. However, if you use other electricity uh, from uh, hydrocarbon-based generation, then, of course, uh, the carbon footprint of your generated hydrogen will be less environmentally uh, friendly. Of course, if you, let's say, use uh, coal-based electricity generation, then even the electrolysis technology can, can result in so-called gray hydrogen. Now, I have included uh, the sources on every slide meticulously, so if you would like to uh, dig in deeper into the topic, then you are very welcome to, to, to check out those sources for further details. Now, with the electrolysis technologies, um, the most mature uh, is the alkaline electrolysis AEL, um, closely followed by the PEM technology. But as I mentioned, uh, European industrial companies are already on the market with all three technologies. Now, when we talk about power to gas, then we usually talk about the electrolysis because uh, that's where you need electricity, which has additional benefits, which 
um, of which I will talk about uh, shortly after the following slide. Now, uh, there is additional technology which is called pyrolysis, which is producing hydrogen uh, from methane. Of course, pyrolysis in general is a, it can be used for, for other um, um, uses as well. So, pyrolysis is a process of chemically decomposing organic materials, so including carbon, at elevated temperatures in the absence of oxygen. And uh, I have highlighted here two existing procedures to do so, the Carnap process, which is an endothermic reaction, so it needs uh, heat intake, when, which is um, separating um, uh, coal from hydrogen in a plasma burner at 1,600 degrees Celsius. But there are additional experimental technologies as well. One of them, which I highlighted, uh, continuous catalytic chemical vapor deposition, CCCVD, um, which has the benefit that the output produces carbon nanotubes, which can be used in very high-tech uh, applications in the industry. Um, and I highlighted another group of technologies, which is actually the methanation of hydrogen. So I jump back one slide, and I would like to focus, and I would like you to focus on the electrolysis side. So you produce hydrogen from the electrolysis. Or actually, you can use the other technologies as well, but there is no point because you are producing methane. So, uh, with the electrolysis, you produce hydrogen, and you have the possibility to produce methane from that hydrogen. Of course, there is no point to use uh, um, the existing classical technologies to produce methane from the hydrogen. Uh, which you have already produced from methane. So don't use methane produced from hydrogen to produce methane. Uh, that's why uh, the methanation of hydrogen makes sense to be put on top of the, of the electroly electrolytic technologies. Uh, I highlighted here two technologies, thermocatalytic methanation and biological methanation. Uh, which technologies, uh, as production costs of methane, it's pretty expensive, and I will show you on the next slide. At the same time, the benefit of it is that if the output of your production is methane, then you can just feed it into your existing natural gas infrastructure, your underground gas, uh, gas storages, your existing household and industrial appliances can actually use that methane as if it was methane from natural gas, because this is practically natural gas. And your power generation infrastructure to produce electricity and feed it back to the electricity grid, can also use it without any kind of modification. And then, overview of the costs of the different technologies. So, I have collected here different sources, and actually they are more or less in line. So, one, one estimate is from a, a REC, uh, which had a workshop earlier this year. Uh, and here I would like you to focus on the hydrogen production first, so the left two columns, which is the AEL and the PEM uh, life cycle cost of generation of hydrogen. And you can see there that um, based on German market characteristics, uh, average power price, you can see that uh, the cost of megawatt hour of hydrogen would be somewhere around 90 to 100 uh, euro per megawatt hour with the AEL technology and around 80 megawatt hour with the PEM technology. As a next step, uh, you can see that what happens if you produce methane out of the hydrogen, you will see that based on the different methanation technologies, the cost of methane is significantly increased compared to, let's say, the nearly average price of the TPF gas exchange price. So, uh, in this sense, methane is not directly competitive with the methane that you import uh, in the form of natural gas. If we, there is an important note below that graph. Uh, so, about 100 euro per megawatt hour of hydrogen is approximately 3.2, 3.20 euro per kilogram of 
uh, hydrogen, assuming that one kilogram of hydrogen contains 33.33 kilowatt hours of energy. And actually, this figure is relatively well comparable to the uh, cost estimate of Hydrogen Europe uh, to the current time. So, from 2020 to 2025, they estimate hydrogen production to be one and a half to three euro per kilogram based on electrolysis technology. And then, um, but they also estimate that up to 2050, the cost of hydrogen production will significantly decrease. And I will show you on the next, next slide uh, where they see this decrease to come from. Also, I have put up uh, and the other two uh, uh, technologies, the Quartner and the CCCVD cost estimate, which are in the magnitude of five euro per kilogram. But again, the CCCVD technology is yet experimental. So um, that might be once it's scaled up and once the industrial application is, is available, that cost might change or will change if we assume a learning curve with the increase of, of, of install capacity. On the next slide, I continue uh, with, uh, with discussing the costs. And uh, on the left, again, from Hydrogen Council, uh, you can see a table which highlights a number of different scenarios. Cost of renewable hydrogen with varying life cycle cost of electricity and different load factors, and actually different CAPEX values for the electrolyzers. And uh, what we can see is that um, obviously, if the cost of electricity is lower and the, the, the cost of the, the CAPEX of the electrolyzer is lower, then the cost of producing hydrogen will be lower. Um, and of course, on the right side, you can see that why they foresee that the cost of producing hydrogen will decrease uh, from today's values. Uh, so they forecast that the CAPEX need for electrolyzer installation will decrease, the efficiency of the electrolyzers will increase, and um, they also foresee that um, the life cycle cost of electricity from offshore wind, of course, this is a particular application of the electrolyzer if it directly uses offshore wind, can also contribute to the decreased cost of producing hydrogen. And with that, they foresee a potential of a significant 50-60% decrease in cost of hydrogen production uh, within 10 years, practically. But then why are we talking about the hydrogen and, uh, and what can be the role of, of, of the hydrogen technology and, and, and what is power to get and what role it can play in the future energy systems? Now, just to uh, start it off with a very hands-on example, I have put up the uh, last uh, month's um, production mix of the Hungarian uh, uh, system. This data is from yesterday, actually, from Magyar, the Hungarian TSO. And this shows the generation mix in Hungary in the last month. And the yellow, you can see that the solar production. Um, on the right side, you can see from 10 net the same uh, one last month production um, of wind generation with forecast and actual production and the contribution of, of, of uh, offshore production. And you can see that huge swing in both cases, of course, compared to the size of the system, the solar swing in Hungary is much smaller compared to the wind uh, uh, generation uh, differences between uh, peak production and when there is no wind. But um, of course, with the, with the European strategy and with the renewable deployment rates that we are seeing, uh, these swings will only increase uh, in the grid and the transmission system operators will face uh, potentially bigger and bigger problems of balancing the grid and managing the frequency. 
And what can be done? Of course, uh, the transmission system has to be in balance at every moment to keep the 50 hertz uh, frequency of the system. And you can uh, either uh, stop generators or you can increase the demand. And this is the point where the power to gas and hydrogen generation are coming to the picture in the form of demand response of helping to uh, balance the grid and uh, thus keep the, uh, the, the, the frequency. And how it can be done? So um, this is one of the illustrations of the sector coupling, uh, which you can find hundreds of uh, types of pictures. This is actually from Enfog roadmap for the gas grid, but usually all of them uh, use the same illustrations and, and, and the same uses. Uh, with the coupling of the of the electricity and the gas systems. So what is happening here is that obviously you produce wind and solar power uh, and based electricity and you feed it into the grid. Of course, you produce also electricity from, from different generation types, so from non-renewable sources, which can feed into an electrolyzer. Um, of course, what you can also do is that you can do practically an island of generation capacity from wind or solar, and you can directly feed that, that uh, generated electricity into an electrolyzer. And that electrolyzer will produce uh, hydrogen. Now, you can do numerous things with that hydrogen. You can, um, as we have seen with the technologies, you can produce methane out of it. Of course, as of now, this seems to be pretty expensive, but maybe in the future, it, it, it will converge more to the import price or the, or the exchange traded price of, of, of natural gas. You can also blend it uh, with the natural gas, which is in the gas grid, or you can actually develop a core hydrogen networks and feed, feed in pure hydrogen into that network. And how can you use it? So actually, uh, if you directly link the electrolyzer to an energy island, which can be wind or solar generation, then uh, you, can, you can make uh, the energy production of that uh, renewable generation more, more flat uh, by storing the produced energy in the hydrogen and then when needed, burning the hydrogen and producing electricity again, which is a clear contribution to, to, to grid balancing. What you can also do is uh, if you are not on an energy island and the electrolyzer is not directly connected to the renewable generation, of course, um, you can have um, the electrolyzer step in to the grid to consume uh, electricity when, when it's needed. Uh, again, with that helping the balancing of the, um, the balancing capability of the TSO and as such um, having demand response to, to, uh, to uh, peak production. Of course, uh, this, can all, this can all go through the market and there can be a price signal. Uh, of course, when the wind and the solar generation is high and let's say we are in a peak low period, so on the weekend, during the night, when there is no uh, electricity consumption from the industry or from the household, and then you have suddenly high wind uh, in, in, in northern Germany, and, and then um, the price of the electricity goes very low or possibly even uh, the negative, then that might be the price signal which the electrolyzer operator needs to, to, to turn on the electrolyzer and start to consume electricity and thus produce hydrogen, which can be then relatively cheap. Of course, uh, depending on the situation where this electrolyzer is installed, depending on the uh, season, the day, the hour, of course, these all kinds of uses uh, can vary. And there are, there are uh, different business models which are imaginable for, for, a, for an electrolyzer to actually um, um, be able to operate financially viably. And then once we have that hydrogen, again, you can do tremendous things with that hydrogen. You can use it to store energy within the existing gas grid. If you have a, a, a backbone pure hydrogen grid, you can also use that hydrogen there. You can uh, try to store it or you can actually use it within transport, within industry, or within households as well. 
Of course, all, all these applications and this future demand of hydrogen is not yet there. Forecasts show that, um, that the hydrogen demand could very significantly grow, but of course, for that, you would need the transport applications to be uh, economically feasible for freight transport or even for, for, for uh, personal transport in the cities, but uh, we are not necessarily yet there. So, um, this is a very complex um, um, challenge to be solved, and that's what policymakers and regulators already think and work about um, and within the European Union, also in the European Commission. There is a hydrogen strategy um, under development within the European Union. Uh, there is a hydrogen alliance launched by the Commission, so these discussions are ongoing, of course. Uh, there are uh, other uh, challenges which have to be overcome. I will touch upon them uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, but maybe through this uh, very simple introduction, you can, you can already see uh, the synergies uh, between the different applications of hydrogen and how it can help the electricity grid, how it can help actually to use the, the existing gas grid in the future, how it can help to produce or to, to make the, the, the gas infrastructure or the gas usage green or greener and thus um, not have stranded assets in 30 or 40 years um, and in the form of, of gas grids. Of course, biogas can also help in that respect. And uh, all this system, through the price signals of electricity and gas, can provide uh, the necessary um, impetus for, for, for the system to work. But it still needs a lot of regulatory challenges and policy challenges to be solved and implemented, which, uh, which also this discussion has to be started in the energy community as well. Here I, would, uh, I, I put up, again, from the Hydrogen Council, a number of other uses, of also including the, the previous ones uh, of, of, of hydrogen. And if you read it through, uh, you will see um, what kind of opportunities lie there, which can actually produce the demand for hydrogen in the future. But of course, it's also needed that the hydrogen is available uh, economically viably at a reasonable cost, which is comparable with the existing uh, cost of energy carriers and fuels. So, all in all, the hydrogen can complement the electrification, uh, the ongoing electrification and the future planned electrification of the next decade, and can provide a significant potential for synergies between the production, transportation, and various industrial utilization. Additionally, it can help the power and gas systems to decarbonize. And of course, it, it can also help the transportation system to decarbonize. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, it can contribute to long-term utilization of the existing gas grids, which might also um, uh, decrease the pressure to, to, to um, build huge electricity grids and, and, and put in place huge electricity grid development. Uh, it has to be noted, I don't have it on the slide, but uh, um, um, transporting energy in the, in the gas infrastructure in the form of methane or as a matter of fact hy uh, hydrogen, transporting one unit of energy in the form of methane or hydrogen is actually much cheaper than transporting the same unit of energy in the form of electricity in the power grid. So this is certainly an, 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 an alternative solution, which might prove cheaper. Of course, we also have to note the challenges that uh, uh, there is a huge um, challenge for the interoperability of the gas grid. So by now, we are approaching a unified European, unified, yes, um, a functioning uh, European gas market. Uh, and however, in case different countries start to apply different strategies for their countries, be it they want to focus on biogas, other countries might would like to focus on hydrogen, 
and then if you would like to use the existing same grid to do so, then you run the risk of fragmenting the uh, by now pretty well functioning gas market within the European Union. So this poses huge interoperability questions which have to be solved with regulation and, uh, and with policy making, and I don't have answers to that, I just pop up the question. Um, and of course, you also have the alternative option to, to develop a, a, a hydrogen backbone network in Europe. Of course, there are also questions about uh, the applicability of the existing gas grid until uh, how much ratio you can blend hydrogen into the natural gas and, and until what level do the existing compressor stations and bath stations can function? How, how much hydrogen, how much blended hydrogen can underground gas storage take on without, without actually losing that hydrogen because hydrogen molecule is much smaller than the methane molecule? Um, so these questions, uh, there are pilot projects ongoing which are, which are testing the existing gas infrastructure, which are testing the underground gas storage and they are trying to measure what is the higher limit until when you can blend hydrogen into the existing uh, natural gas. So these challenges lay ahead. I wanted to just uh, actually um, introduce it on a, on, on a high level, the topics which are, which are there um, from, from production of hydrogen technologies uh, through the cost of the different technologies, um, going through the, um, the, the power to gas applications of hydrogen, how it can have the transmission grid, how it can have the gas grid, uh, what are the synergies of the different utilization, and I, again, also slightly touched up on the, the challenges lying ahead. So that would be the summary of what we heard today, and I thank you for your attention. And I'm very happy for your for your questions or comments.